Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, so much better. I'm John McEwen. I'm the executive director of the New Jersey Theater Alliance, and it's so wonderful to have you all with us for the 13th annual Excellence in Cultural Access Awards. And to celebrate the New Jersey Cultural Access Network Project's 30th anniversary. This is a day I look forward to each year because it brings colleagues together for a day of learning, sharing, and networking as we all continue to strengthen our commitment to making facilities, programs, and services accessible to our patrons, artists, staff, volunteers with disabilities, and older adults. In addition, we celebrate and recognize the outstanding leadership and innovation of individuals and organizations who are making an impact on this work. I cannot believe that this initiative is celebrating its 30th anniversary, and we all look exactly the same. <laughs> In fact, I would say we look better, right? I re remember approaching Elizabeth Christofferson, chair of the Arts Council at the time, and Jean Hooper, vice chair, to share my idea about a program to assist New Jersey's arts and cultural community in making programs and facilities accessible to all. I was working at Paper Mill Playhouse at the time and saw that Paper Mill was one of the few arts organizations in our state that was offering accessible programming. I saw that there was a need to offer resources and educational support to assist the entire field in this work. I'm so proud of the Arts Council because without hesitation, literally within a few months, they saw that this was a commitment and a value of the Council. And we kicked off the newly formed New Jersey Arts Access Task Force. Remember that name? With a two-day conference, it takes more than a ramp. This event attracted more than 350 colleagues from the field who participated in a series of workshops. Since then, we have changed our name to the Cultural Access Network Project, provided the field more than 150 roundtables and sensitivity training sessions, launched a quarterly cultural access newsletter, made available to the field a surveying tool to assist organizations in measuring elements of their facility to ensure it met ADA standards, developed a self-assessment tool to assist the field with their ADA plans, developed an ADA plan template for the field, collected a series of resources that are available on the Theater Alliance's website, launched the Excellence in Cultural Access Awards program, and most recently developed a cultural access calendar to assist the public in easily finding accessible events offered by our community. We are grateful and honored for the partnership with the New Jersey State Council on the Arts. And I also want to give a shout out to everyone here at Grounds for Sculpture. They have hosted this event since its beginning. And thank you, Lauren Shepard, Gary Schneider, everyone here at Grounds for Sculpture. Your hospitality is, is so appreciated by us all. We are also honored and grateful for the dedication of the individual who's, individuals who serve on the Cultural Access Network Project Committee, both past and present. And I would like to recognize those individuals who are with us today. Steve Runk is with us. Woo woo! <laughs> Maureen Heffernan. Perry Neron, Julie Hahn, Pam Gaston, Crystal Allen, and Kathy Roy. Thank you all so much for your dedication, time, and guidance that you all have committed to to make New Jersey's cultural community a leader in cultural accessibility. As I travel around the country, I consistently hear how blessed we are to have such an amazing partnership 
with our New Jersey State Council on the Arts. Their unwavering commitment to this work for the past 30 years is an inspiration to everyone, all of our colleagues around the country. New Jersey is the only state that requires its grantees to submit an ADA plan in order to receive state funding. This is just one example of the Council's dedication to this work. I personally want to thank Council's ADA coordinators that I've had the pleasure to work with, Steve Rung, Don, Don Eamon, and Mary Eileen Forat, as well as the Council board and staff for making this work a core value and for their support and being such treasured colleagues. I am delighted today that we have the Council's Executive Director with us, and so happy to welcome her to the podium. Please welcome Allison Tratner, Executive Director of the Arts Council. Thank you, John, and hi, everybody. He said a lot of things that were kind of emotional. It's really, really uh, nice to hear. Thank you. Um, uh, and thank you to the New Jersey Theatre Alliance staff uh, and board for all the work that you do all year round for the community in New Jersey and for the people of New Jersey, and especially the work you did to get us to today. Right, today is no small feat, so thank you for that. And it's so nice to be here at Grounds for Sculpture, and what a gorgeous day we have. The State Arts Council and the Theatre Alliance have been partners in this work, as John said, for 30 years. And it was John's vision all those years ago, and I'm glad you named the people in leadership at the council at the time. It was, uh, as I'm told, I mean, I've been at the council a long time, but not quite 30 years. <laughs> um, I'm told it really was, as you say. It was immediately welcomed and embraced and implemented, and it was John's vision and their partnership that put all of this important work in motion 30 years ago. We've seen the network grow over the years to offer a wide range of services that help facilitate increased access, education, and change. And to echo what John said, special thanks to those steering committee members, the ones that are here in the room, the ones who have served over the 30 years. It's their expertise that really makes the work meaningful. All of the collective commitment that we've heard John say, that, that I've said, that I know you all know about, it makes the Cultural Access Network project the nationally regarded model that John mentioned. And I'm just gonna go ahead and say a couple of the different prestigious organizations that have given a nod to this network. The New Jersey Department of Human Services, the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, the Kessler Foundation, the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies, and the Kennedy Center. It's really true when I travel around or to work with my colleagues networked nationally, this, this program really is a model and this partnership is, is unique. So at the Council, even then and now, the network is as much a place for us to lead as it is for us to learn. So core to the mission was to create sustainable change and build momentum toward a truly accessible arts sector. And as the largest funder of the arts in the state, the council saw from the very beginning the opportunity to deepen our impact by holding ourselves and our grantees accountable through the development of accessibility training and plans that at a minimum meet the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So just about 20 years ago for the first time, after years of learning and advocacy, ADA planning did become a requirement for all council grantees, and that requirement remains today. And through partnership with the Cultural Access Network, we provide professional development opportunities for the field on a regular basis. And these offerings are created to try to keep pace with the changing world that we're all living in. Annually, we create these programs with input from partners, grantees, the public, to help us understand the barriers to arts participation at every level. So, as I said, I haven't been here for 30 years, but I've been here a long time. The Council's dedication to making the arts accessible in New Jersey was part of my orientation. It's, you know, it's, it's part of the DNA of the place. And we have had a long string of passionate and knowledgeable access coordinators two of them are here today. They lead our team internally to ensure that the standards of accessibility are considered in all aspects of our work. So as John mentioned, Steve Runk, 
was the one who was doing that work, he was in that role when I got there. And for many years, he skillfully and reliably just, he kept issues of access top of mind. And then after Steve, the role was filled by Don Eamon, who we know isn't here today, but I know many of you know him, and he was a champion of this work for decades. And then for the past few years, Mary Eileen Parrott, who's here with us, she brings to this work such deep knowledge of the field and helps to ensure that public funds entrusted to us at the council are invested in arts programs and organizations that meet and exceed accessibility standards. A lesson that I learned a long time ago and has collectively been enforced through these people who I just mentioned is that access is bigger than compliance. It's more than just removing barriers. True access means creating opportunities that are authentic for anyone who wants to be there. A patron, a donor, a volunteer, a staff person, an artist. Access means you know you're welcome. So I'd like to congratulate today's Access Award honorees and thank you for your work. These last couple of years especially have brought to light some new challenges and exciting opportunities for access and equity in our field. And as we continue to adapt and innovate, I look forward to working with the Theater Alliance and all of you to make New Jersey's arts industry accessible for all. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce somebody that I've known at least 30 years, I think longer, right Beth? Uh, Beth Pervor, who is our access coordinator. And I'm delighted uh, because Beth and I have worked together uh, for a long time over the years. Uh, we met actually when I was working at Paper Mill and uh, have worked on many projects and delighted uh, about a year ago that uh, Beth uh, joined us on staff as our access coordinator. So thank you for all that you do, Beth, for our field, not only here in New Jersey, but what you do for the field nationally and so delighted to always work with you and partner with you. And I'm gonna turn this part of the program over to you. Thank you, John. Yes, it's 30 something years, it's a long time. And I'm, I'm just thrilled to actually uh, finally be officially working with the Theater Alliance that I've kind of worked on and off for many years. So it's, it's, a, it's a thrill and a delight for me as well to be a part of this. And I've been attending these, these um, convenings and luncheons for many years, so now I feel a part of it, so thank you. Um, so I don't have really pre any prepared speech, but this next part, um, we were talking about the, the impact of uh, the Cultural Access Network um, and you know, thinking about how we could express what we felt the impact had been on the community of New Jersey, and then we thought, well, maybe we shouldn't be saying this. Maybe we should ask people to tell us what the impact was for them. So we have a few plants in the audience, so people were prepared with their statements. So, so I just want to kind of ask people who would like to say a couple of words about the impact of the Cultural Access, Access Network on them and their organizations. Who's first? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. And we had Deontay as our runner. <laughs> so uh, Ocean County is one of 21 art agencies in New Jersey. Uh, some are part of the county, some are independent. Uh, and I think that the uh, Cultural Ac the Access Committee is, network is a tremendous success. Uh, whenever John says pro project, I always think of it as like, you know, they're seeing whether it works, you know, like it's a prototype, but it's not. And I, I just want to mention a couple of things. I think the resources on your website are fantastic. We regularly uh, recommend people uh, to that. Uh, number two, your Thursday around tables are fantastic. It, it's great to have the sensitivity sessions, but to have those specific uh, activities are, are just are fantastic. And um, of course, this is a very nice uh, organization and having John as a resource is terrific. 
But I would say the thing that I am most grateful for is something that John said the very first time I came here 13 years ago. And when he made a presentation where he said, you know, if you advertise, if you're ADA compliant and you advertise, you're going to make more money than if you don't. And I thought, wow, that's like a message, right? So I just want to say personally, that was one of the best things. And if we have, uh, you know, encouraged our organizations in Ocean County to follow that. So I'm very grateful for this uh, endeavor. And remember that people with disabilities have a lot of money. We have a lot of, like, leftover money. So, you know, contact us. We'll come. <laughs> Who's next? Hey, I'm uh, Steve Runk. Um, I'm currently at the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton University. Um, but I was here at the beginning of the Arts Access Task Force. Um, and uh, as you heard from Allison and John, and I remember my director of the Arts Council at the time, Barbara Moran, came up to me and said, w John Kim McEwen's are creating this new task force that's gonna help people with accessibility and we want you to be the council liaison to it. And I was like, I don't know anything. But now I know a lot 30 years later. And that is, um, First due to John, I mean, everything that he has brought, all the expertise that he has brought to all the work that um, has been done. And 30 years later, I'm still going to the Thursday roundtables because, you know, as far as we've all come, and I've had the opportunity to see how far New Jersey has come in 30 years with accessibility, and it's been amazing, and you should all be proud. We have a lot more work to continue doing, and um, I know I'm continuing to learn all the time. Um, so um, 30 years of thanks and appreciation to the Cultural Access Network, and particularly to John. And I, I just want to add, I, I'm like a New Yorker. Like, I'm from, like, across, <laughs> across the water. I, I try to shame New York all the time about, like, what we do in comparison to New Jersey. We pale. We are, we, we pale terribly compared to New, New Jersey. And so I, in that respect, I am, I am proud and honored to be a part of it. But I go back to New York all the time and I say, you should look at Jersey. I mean, you guys are, we, we are terrible compared to Jersey. So we look at you as an example. And you, you, you all should be incredibly proud of what you do because nobody else does it. Nobody else walks the walk and talks the talk like you do it here. So as just as what you do and what John has, has created and kept going, um, you should be so incredibly proud of the work that you do here because, you know, I'm, I'm working with Mary Eileen and the State Arts Council, and it's a pleasure to actually work with people who support and, and not, only, not only their support, but they want their organizations to support as well. So it kind of, it's a flow down, and it's great. So be proud. Next. Hi, I'm Gina Pisasau. I go by she, her. I'm 5'2", East Asian. I have a pastel kind of color block shirt on. Um, I, with the culture, I'm, I, I'm, I'm with the McCarter Theater. <laughs> um, so the Cultural Access Network project means that to, what it's meant to me is bringing an amazing visibility to populations uh, that are not part of kind of mainstream awareness to a certain extent. And it's the consistent call to accountability to those folks that have not had access to what's in the title. And what that has felt like is an expansion of heart and mind and uh, just adding to like, I think the broadness of of diversity of life and the spectrum and for all of us to be more human. So it's a challenge and it's opened all of us, I think, to consider how to be more human in this world. <laughs> um, the Cultural Access Network too offers this feeling of, of community and that none of us are alone in this work and that there's a constant like reminder that we're not alone. And also that people like to hear, constantly hear people actually doing things is a reminder that it's possible because I think we can get mired in our despair so easily, but it's just like, no, we just need to put something on our website that says we're ADA compliant. You know, so it's just like, <laughs> what are the easy, like what is, where, what is the large, the big picture of course, you know, that is never going to be done, but what is our North Star? But what are like just the steps that you can just do today, you know what I mean, for accessibility? Um, and that it's only gonna benefit all of us in the end. 
Thank you. Do we have any, one more? In 2010, uh, I'm with the College of New Jersey, our new dean at the time came to me and said, help me launch a center for the arts at the College of New Jersey. And I'm gonna give you this title, assistant dean, uh, excuse me, assistant director of audience services. I said, well, that's great, but I've never worked in the arts. I don't know, you know, front of house, back of house, what is this stuff? So we launched the Center for the Arts, and I'm looking at this title saying Audience Services, and I started to explore. And I found John and the Cultural Access Network, and since 2010, I have been at everything I could, and I have learned so much to try to figure out what it means to truly serve not just an audience, but the people who make up the audiences. And it brings me back to that concept of servant leadership. And I think that John exemplifies that concept and has done so much to, to help me follow in that path. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for all I've learned and, and all of the wonderful people I've got to, to meet as I participate in this group. And just want to keep going. So thank you. Oh, I think. Hi, I'm Maureen Heffernan, and I'm on the steering committee, so I'll say that ahead of time. And I'm a uh, large senior woman with white hair. And um, I want to say that what it's meant for me to be able to serve as part of this First of all, when I was an arts administrator, it made me do better in terms of serving the people that I was working for and with. But as I've matured, both with this committee and in my life, um, I have found that I have benefited as a client. And, you know, like, when open captioning seemed like a great idea for me when I was 30, <laughs> you know, or without that. Now open caption feels like a necessity for me. You know, and, and I see that not just from myself, but from my peers. All those people said, well, I don't really need that stuff, but I guess they'll have it. But now they go like, oh, is it gonna be captioned? Can I go at that time? And the same thing in terms of the idea of what access means, to really be not only um, compliant, but welcoming, as Allison said. To know that if I go to this place or do this program, I will feel welcomed. I won't feel like an, an obstacle, you know, for someone or a hassle. And um, that education I've certainly learned from John, from Steve, from all the people from Mary Eileen, and I'm so grateful for it and so grateful to have been able to be part of the movement that did that, that has come round to be of service to me that I never imagined when I first started. So thank everybody who's been part of this. So thank you all, and I think there is one final testimonial that we will see on our screen. So take it away. Hello, my name is Beth Bienvenu, and I'm the Director of Accessibility at the National Endowment for the Arts. Congratulations to the New Jersey Theater Alliance and the Cultural Access Network for these significant milestone anniversaries and for the work that you do to help ensure that New Jersey's cultural sector is accessible, inclusive, and equitable for everyone, including people with disabilities and older adults. Your partnership with the New Jersey State Arts Council is an important part of this work, helping their grantees with their compliance requirements and helping them go beyond compliance toward ensuring full inclusion, participation, and access. The NEA couldn't do its work to support the arts sector without the efforts of state arts agencies across the country and valuable partnerships such as the one between the Cultural Access Network and the New Jersey State Arts Council. This 30-year partnership is such an important model for the field. So kudos to all of you for 30 years of this amazing work.
thank you, Beth, and thank you all for your wonderful uh, comments. In 1908, 27-year-old Helen Keller visited New Jersey and gave testimony to the state legislature, calling for the establishment of a state uh, agency to remove and in, to improve the living conditions of the blind. The New Jersey Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired was established in 1910 by order of the New Jersey State Legislature and as a division of the State Department of Human Services, making it not only one of the oldest continually operating agencies in New Jersey state government, but also in the United States. The agency's mission is to promote and provide services in the areas of education, employment, independent living, and eye health through informed choice and partnership with persons who are blind, deafblind, or visually impaired, their families, and the community. The Commission's service and programs are designed to enable consumers to achieve full inclusion and integration in society through success in employment, independent living, and social self-sufficiency. The Commission's staff are committed to providing a full array of consumer-centered services with the goal of making it possible for the estimated 259,000 blind, deafblind, and severely visually impaired New Jersey residents to have the opportunity to use their talents, strengths, and abilities to achieve their full potential. To that end, the Commission also works diligently to promote access to community resources to facilitate academic, economic, recreational, and social equality for the people. It has been their mission to serve for 110 years. My relationship with the Commission goes back well more than 30 years. From my early days at Paper Mill, the Commission was instrumental in helping us build our audience for blind and low vision adults and children. As we instituted sensory seminars and audio description, they not only helped us spread the word about the program, but invited us to speak at their conferences and get other gatherings to build the awareness of these services since this was the first time that they were being offered in our state. Since that time, the Commission continues to be an advocate and resource of our cultural community as they make their programs and facilities accessible. Pam Gaston does an excellent job in reaching out to the community to inform them about what programs are being offered by our field, and I have enjoyed working every moment these past 30 plus years with you, Pam. Pam and Crystal Allen, they continue to be our advocates and wonderful ambassadors as members of our Cultural Access Network Project Committee. We thank the Commission for all of their support, for their ambassadorship, and helping to support our community's efforts and making arts accessible to the blind and low vision community. It is my pleasure to present this year's Leadership Award to Dr. Bernice Davis, Executive Director of the New Jersey Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Dr. Davis. great to be here this afternoon. Uh, thank you to all who ordered the beautiful day to celebrate this, this really uh, great occasion. I just wanted to say to the Cultural a Access Network, uh, thank you for all of your great works. And also we know that people are behind those great works. So I just wanted to say to the partners and stakeholders and to the people that each and every day push for access, uh, you have my greatest gratitude. And to John McEwen, thank you and the Cultural Access Network for selecting the New Jersey Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired for this year's Leadership Award. It's a tremendous honor for the Commission to be recognized for our efforts to promote accessibility and inclusion for people who are blind, deafblind, and visually impaired. We believe that our consumers want and increasingly expect, as they should, 
to have opportunities to experience theater, museums, and other cultural activities as fully as their sighted peers. I was just speaking with someone in regards to language access, but it's all connected. Cultural access is also very powerful. There's beauty and levity in terms of offering someone, in addition to what we do at the commission, a lot of independent living skills, vocational skills. But once you have these basic needs really met, we also need that levity and beauty. We're more than just a skill set or into skill set building. So I just wanted to relay, we certainly recognize the empowerment for cultural access. Here in New Jersey, great strides have been made in accessibility for patrons who are blind, deaf, blind, and visually impaired. The Cultural Access Network under John McEwen's leadership has been instrumental in the implementation of audio description and other accessibility improvements that all resulted, excuse me, <clears throat> little froggy, go away, uh, and other accessibility uh, improvements that all result in improving the quality of life for people that our agency serves. The commission is fortunate to have had the opportunity to establish and maintain a results yielding partnership with the Cultural Access Network over many, many years. And we look forward to continuing to serve as a resource in support of the very important work that CAN does. And I would not uh, like to end before thanking Pamela Gaston, Crystal Allen, who always make sure that not only the Cultural Access Network, but also cultural access is at the forefront for our staff, our consumers, and our stakeholders. So thank you for the phenomenal job that you have done and that you'll continue to do. Dr. Davis, so is Heather Williams from Matheny still with us? Heather, Heather, would you mind coming up? So we have a, a special uh, gift for you and the commission. And um, Heather Williams is with the Matheny Art Access Program. And she's going to tell you a little bit about this most beautiful piece of art from one of the artists uh, over at Matheny. So Heather, do you want to talk a little bit about the piece and the artist? Sure. So this piece, called Scarlet, was made by one of our artists, Faith Stoltz, who is in her late 30s. And she is a woman with cerebral palsy who is nonverbal. And through our program, Stroke by Stroke, we, she worked with a facilitator to create this piece, which I'm going to cheat, took about five months from start to end. And through our program, all of our artists are able to have their work come to fruition. Um, and she'll be so delighted that she gets to share her artwork with you. So thank you for what you do. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is a beautiful art piece. There's a, a square wooden frame, and there is a huge gold bow. <laughs> um, and then the artwork is just really colorful, and there's lots of waves, wave-like um, texture on it with gold and blue and green and pink, and it's really beautiful. Uh, thank you for this beautiful work of the heart. We'll treasure it. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Mary Eileen Farratt, Program Officer at the New Jersey State Council on the Arts and the ADA Coordinator for the Council. And uh, Mary Eileen, I said it this morning, but we have some new folks, so I want to say it again. Thank you so much for your commitment, your partnership. We've known each other a very long time, and I treasure your friendship and your colleague and uh, thank you for all that you do for us in our entire field in this work and so many other hats that you wear. So 
Mary Eileen Forat. Thank you. Right back at you, John. Um, I'm a mature white woman with chin length hair. It's kind of brown and gray, maybe a little blonde still, I don't know. Um, I'm wearing a black dress and a black sweater, and I have black glasses and black sandals. There's a lot of black today. So I am pleased to be introducing this award, the Innovator Award, presentation to the Deaf Blind Community Access Network of New Jersey. People who've combined a loss of hearing and vision, as well as their families, friends, and the professionals who work with them, often turn to the DeafBlind Community Access Network of New Jersey for inspiration, resources, connections, knowledge, and a fun, understanding, and accepting community. With a motto of For DeafBlind, By DeafBlind, this grassroots nonprofit, founded in 2016, develops host activities, trainings, and events in response to specific needs identified by the community. Due to the in-person restrictions imposed by COVID-19, the organization had to discover new ways to connect with deafblind people, many of whom were feeling overwhelming isolation and loneliness, especially at the height of the pandemic. The organization ventured into the arts when they adapted the 2021 Oscar-nominated short film, Feeling Through, into a version accessible to deafblind people on a virtual platform. The film stars, for the first time ever, a deafblind actor in a leading role. Accessibility adaptations for the virtual screening included a described transcript available prior to the screening, playing the film at a slower speed to make it easier to see for those with low vision, visual and environmental descriptions, live captioning, American Sign Language interpreters, in-person communication facilitators, a live Q&A with the film's director, and popcorn sent to each attendee. Positive feedback led to an encore performance. A holiday adaptation of a Charlie Brown Christmas with the same adaptations followed in December 2021 and also resulted in an encore performance. This spring, the organization was invited to provide deafblind expertise on a possible upcoming production of a film about Helen Keller. Our committee was so impressed with the innovative approach the organization took to connect with the deafblind community. The organization strives to foster an atmosphere of inclusion of the entire extended deafblind community, as well as pride in educating the larger mainstream community of the capabilities of individuals who are deafblind. Inspired and motivated by increased camaraderie, new friendships, spirited conversations, and requests for more, the organization pledges to continue to find innovative and accessible solutions. Accepting the award is Catherine Garvey, President of the Board of Trustees for the Deafblind Community Access Network of New Jersey. So much, Mary Eileen, for that lovely, just overwhelming introduction. Thank you so much. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of DB Can, New Jersey, I'm completely humbled to accept this award. Thank all of you, all of you, for recognizing our work and for believing that deafblind people deserve access. Our work will continue. Um, our board will be considering our next holiday accessible film. Last year, as mentioned, we did Charlie Brown Christmas. So this year we're looking for another um, film to make accessible for our deafblind community. Next year, we may venture into a feature length film, either Coda or The Sound of Metal. Um, as also mentioned, we are working with uh, deaf actress Hillary Back on her hopeful presentation of a film on Helen Keller, 
This happens to be Helen Keller Deafblind Awareness Week in New Jersey, and we're honored to be working with her in uh, making a film that will present Helen as the activist she was and as a woman. So the award means a lot to us um, as a community, and of course, the finances help us a lot too. Uh, we're a very small nonprofit. We're all volunteers. We have a deafblind access team that tells us what's needed to make our work accessible. So we're all volunteers, but we do have to pay for our access, which means sign language interpreters, captioning services, one-on-one -on -one in-person communicators. So that's where we incur significant expenses. So this is really helpful, very much appreciated from my heart. Thank you all for the great work that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Eileen, and congratulations, uh, Catherine. Um, as an Innovator Award recipient, uh, the DeafBlind uh, Community Access Network does receive a check uh, to assist them in their uh, continued great work. I was, normally I would bring the check with me, but I was overly efficient. As I was printing out other checks, it went in the mail. So as they say, <laughs> the check is in the mail. I now have the pleasure of introducing you to our Champion Award recipient, keynote speaker, and performer, Triple Threat. <laughs> and I first want to, I just want to give a shout out to Miss Ruth Williams and Pam Gaston for introducing us to this incredible young woman. A champion is somebody who fights or argues for a cause on behalf of somebody else who's passionate about something that's going to benefit others, and who is not afraid to keep going even when the road appears tough. This is true of Kaylee Brandle. Kaylee Brandle has been visually impaired all of her life, but that has not stopped her from pursuing her dreams. In 2021, she graduated from Scholar Center for the Humanities program housed at Howell High School having taken eight AP courses and receiving a Principal's Achievement Medal for earning a perfect score on two of her exams. Wow. Woo! That's right. She served as captain of her school's mock trial team for three years and was head counsel every time the team headed to the courtroom to compete. She is also the founder and director of the Sing for Serenity Choir, an international online choir for the blind, which currently has 100 members from approximately 15 countries. She has qualified for the finals of the International Braille Challenge 11 times because she believes that with Braille on her side, an empowered future is at her fingertips. Now she's a rising sophomore at Villanova University double majoring in writing and rhetoric and peace and justice, and triple minoring in humanities, ethics, and disability studies. You know, Kendall, you know, you got to do a little bit more, Kendall. <laughs> she is currently on a pre-law track intending to be a disability rights attorney. She made the dean's list and the president's list for both semesters of her freshman year. When she is not focusing on her academics, she can be found singing with the Villanova a cappello group that she auditioned for called Minor Problem. <laughs> she also competes on Villanova's nationally ranked ethics debate team. She was recently elected outreach coordinator of the Disability Inclusion and Advocacy Group on campus called Level. She has sang at the White House three times, and she just released her first album last October. <laughs> Woo! Now that sounds like a champion to me. We are so happy to have Kayla with us today to share with us some thoughts and her miraculous talents. 
please welcome Kaylee Brindle. One moment, please. <laughs> Hope everyone's having a great day. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> well, you know what? Before I start, just thank you again to John. Can you guys give it up for John one more time? Because he's the one that made all this possible, and he had me here. Okay, ready? Here's your hand. Okay. Wait. Okay. There we go. Thursday, it's just me here as the stars talk softly. No time for tears when I'm feeling awfully low. Time to write, then I'll be okay. Can you hear my songs even though you're gone? It's been so long, and I just want to know. Have you met God yet? Because you were. These past few years, and it's been a rough without you here, but I'm getting through. Cause I remember you, and you see me from up on God's balcony. And my songs still sound the same. Can you see how proud I am to tell everybody?
Thank you. <laughs> Wait, should I set this down or? Okay. We're switching mics here. Hold on a sec. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> there we go. All right, my name is Kaylee Brendel, and I'm so grateful that I've been given the opportunity to speak and sing to all of you today. Being a performer is one of the greatest honors of my life. Over the years, when I played the piano or sang at various venues, people have seemed rather stunned that I can do what I do given that I'm visually impaired. I always use each of those exchanges as opportunities to explain that my disability in no way prevents me from making the craft I love. I just go about it in a different way. I can't really read printed sheet music, as this might suggest. Uh, so when I began piano lessons at the age of nine, my instructor and I devised a different approach, consisting of music theory, memorization, and a reliance on my synesthesia. With regards to music theory, I would explain it as a sort of language or code. It gives each note and chord a technical name. For example, if my piano instructor told me to play A major, I would know to play A, C sharp, and E. We recorded all of our lessons and I would locate slowed down versions of the pieces we were working on via YouTube. I would listen to these slowed down recordings throughout the day so that I could commit the piece to memory. This emphasis on memorization helped me academically as well because it strengthened my ability to retain and subsequently regurgitate information. <laughs> With regards to the final component of our strategy, my synesthesia, I possess the ability to see color when I hear music. Every note has a color. For example, when I sing an A, so that would be ooh, I see a beautiful shade of yellow, like the color of a dandelion or warm rays of sunshine. Chords are little works of art in my head. Entire pieces of music are like vibrant tapestries. The colors definitely assisted me with memorizing. And this was another component that would prove use, useful to me in school as well, because I can also see colors in letters and numbers. Memorizing formulas for algebra or facts for history was just like memorizing Debussy or Mozart. I approach singing the same way I do playing piano. I memorize every song using theory and color. I've been singing ever since I could practically talk. I, just, I would start by performing Sesame Street songs to passersby from my porch when I was three. <laughs> and now I have an album out consisting of six songs I wrote, and one of them is the one you just heard called Badge of Honor about my grandmother. Songwriting is an amazing and really therapeutic way of expressing emotions. I definitely enjoy it. It feels like a cathartic release for me. I don't write songs by pulling up note flight or a muse score and inputting the melody and lyrics like others might. Instead, I email myself the lyrics and make a voice memo recording on my phone where I sing the melody. Performing an original song is an incredible experience, especially when the song and the experience that inspired it is really important to me. That's the case with Badge of Honor, uh, the one I was mentioning before. I'm so glad that the first time I ever performed that live was in front of you all right now. Uh, <laughs> it's a memory I'll definitely never forget, and I know that she is, she's watching from God's balcony. However, you'll notice that when I sang, I pretty much stood perfectly still. The only aspect of performance that I have not been able to grasp yet is what vocalists tend to call stage presence. This refers to any movements a performer executes while singing. They might walk across the stage or move their hips or dance fully. I can't see what other performers do and so I don't really have a reference. However, my amazing mom and vocal coach have described what other performers both with and without disabilities do. So 
I'm doing my best to learn and form my own style. I have been in a cappella groups for several years, so I'm able to learn a choreographed routine if it's described to me. The trouble comes when I have to be the choreographer for my solo performances, when I have to figure out how to use the space I'm given. With the music itself, though, being a performer with a disability helps you become innovative and does wonders for your memorization skills. I have reached the same destination with regards to mastering a given song. I just take a different route to get there. I think that there definitely needs to be more advocates standing up for the rights of the disabled, both in the performance sector and in society at large. In terms of what we need on stage, I would love for there to be more resources about how to instruct blind and visually impaired performers about stage movement. The first I've ever heard of a course teaching dance coaches how to instruct the blind was in 2020. We can learn how to do it, we just need to explain it in a different way. It would also be great if there were more accessible mobile applications that let you alter the speed of a track, so that way it can be memorized more easily. Right now, the only way I can slow a track down, if there isn't a slowed down version on YouTube, is via an app called the Amazing Slow Downer. <laughs> However, the Amazing Slow Downer is not fully accessible, and I have to rely on the vision I do have when I attempt to use it. Stages themselves also need to be ADA compliant. I have dealt with many stages where the only way to get on is via a staircase. And sometimes, the staircase doesn't have a railing. That's not only difficult for me as a visually impaired performer, but that would be extremely difficult for a wheelchair user. It can also be very disorienting for a blind or visually impaired performer if a very bright stage light is positioned right above us. I've had to perform a few times in conditions where the light was so bright above me that I had to fight not to squint or look away while still focusing on the song. If the performance process was fully accessible, from the preparation stage to the performance stage, the world would get to see the talent of individuals of all abilities. As for what we need to focus on in society at large, I would label website accessibility, voting accessibility, home use medical device accessibility, ADA compliance in buildings, and disability education as the five most important issues. The, <laughs> yeah. the ADA doesn't address website accessibility, and we live in a world where online consumerism is flourishing. Blind and visually impaired people need to be able to purchase goods just as anyone else would. Once I graduate law school, I intend to advocate for an amendment to the ADA or an entirely different piece of legislation that addresses website accessibility and gives businesses the resources they require in order to make their sites work for all. As for voting, I can't wait to vote in my first presidential election in 2024, but the vast majority of polling locations are not equipped with accessible voting machines or with employees who have been trained on how to operate them. Every American has the right to cast their vote freely and independently, so I intend to advocate for the proliferation of more accessible voting machines and training workshops for poll employees. For home use medical devices, everything from COVID tests to equipment that diabetics need isn't accessible. Not every blind student has a, or blind person has a sighted family member on call that can rush over to assist them, and not all of us can perfectly position our cameras in the event that one of them can FaceTime us. These medical devices and at-home tests need to be modified so that a blind or visually impaired individual could use them independently. As for ADA compliance, there are still buildings without elevators, ramps, braille signs, and other additions that would assist the disabled immensely. I had a friend in college who was temporarily disabled due to a sports injury, and she couldn't use the stairs. One of her classes was in a building with no elevator, so she couldn't attend the lectures and was forced to play catch up. For millions of us, this struggle is not temporary. More attention definitely needs to be brought to this area. Finally, we need to educate people about disability so that their first instinct when they see us is not to fear or pity us, 
My first opportunity to learn about disability rights and the experiences of people with other disabilities came in college. I, along with millions of other students, took AP United States History my junior year of high school, and that course is advertised as a complete time We got one more song. <laughs> Anyone know Etta James? Yeah. Well then, at last, we have reached a part of the program that you guys might like. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not good with puns. <laughs>
have a check for Kaylee. And I don't know about you, but I'm very hopeful of the next generation. If it's more folks like this, right? So we have a check for Kaylee to help her in her studies. And we look forward to you advocating and working for people with disabilities to ensure that there's equal access for all, not only in the arts, but in every aspect of our lives. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So before we go, um, there's a few more folks I want to thank. Um, I want to thank the amazing Theater Alliance staff that I have the pleasure of working with every day. I love our team, and I just want to, I think you know them all, but we're going to call them out anyway. So Erica Nagel, our deputy director. Deontay Griffin Quick, our Director of Programs and Services. Lauren Mancuso, our Manager of Digital Communications and Marketing. And Beth Prevor, our Cultural Access Coordinator. Thank you all for not only your support of today's event and this initiative, but all the incredible work that you do for our field. It's an honor to work with you and so proud to have you as my colleagues. So thank you so much for everything. I also want to thank once again the beautiful Grounds for Sculpture, the beautiful staff, the beautiful grounds. They order great weather. They have great food. They are always so hospitable to us uh, every year. So thank you, Lauren Shepard, and everyone here for all of your um, support. Once again, uh, I also want to thank uh, the State Arts Council. Thank you so much for your support. Not only your support of this work, but your support and guidance uh, in all that we do, not only at the Alliance, but all that we do, the field at large. Uh, we are so blessed to have such an incredible agency, and that is not the case that we, as we all know, that we hear from our colleagues around the country. So we are extremely grateful. Thank you so, so much. And I want to give a shout out to each of you, because in these 30 years, you and so many other colleagues, we have seen the strides that have been made. And as Steve so well said, there's more work to do, but we definitely have laid a very strong foundation here in New Jersey. You are opening doors and providing possibilities for audiences, artists, your staff, to ensure that there is equal access for all. And I don't know about you, but a lot of people ask me, why did I even get involved in this work? And the arts and culture mean so much to my quality of life. I cannot imagine if something happened where I lost my sight my mobility, my hearing, and somebody said that you could not participate in arts and culture, it would be devastating. So I'm a believer that we need to ensure that the beauty of what we all do is always there for everyone, and that we're always ready to serve and accommodate. And this is an ongoing journey. We're always going to be learning and I thank all of you for all that you have taught me over these years. So I look forward to continuing the journey uh, with you. We will have roundtables that we'll pick back up in the fall. We do have a cultural access calendar that's going to be relaunched. We launched it, if you remember, and then the pandemic hit a couple of months later. So uh, we are improving um, our own website and, as a result, improving that cultural access calendar. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for uh, shepherding us through that. So more to come on that calendar uh, in August, so be on the outlook uh, for that. And I just want to thank you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful, safe and healthy summer. 
And the award winners, uh, if you could stay a little bit, we'd love to do some photo ops with all of you and our wonderful friends at the Arts Council and our CAN committee members. So if you could stick around, that would be great. So thank you all so much. Have a great summer.